perspective. So I think this is a great open discussion to have amongst yourselves. Like, who do you think is interesting to follow? Like, who do you think is a best practice? Who can you learn? And that may be different today than it is 30 days from now. So I feel like this should be an ongoing conversation amongst you. Um, can we go back to one of the yeah. That's a Facebook post on the right. Facebook post on the right, okay. uh, Twitter post here, and right. Instagram here. Who, just who, who the, the uh, hashtag preventive medicine, is that something that, the, that she created or? I have no idea. I think she probably did, yeah. Okay, so who's going to see that? Anybody that follows her or looks at her page. So the ha again, the hashtag is not really important. Um, people use hashtags to organize around, but they also use hashtags for sarcasm and for like organization. But, so, but that's for that's for Twitter, no? I mean, it, it, hashtags work on um, pretty much all social media accounts. So hashtags, all, literally all hashtags are that number sign with yeah. no space and a word behind it, makes that clickable. So in the days before we had all of this organization and staff around social media, there were no real ways, especially on Twitter, there were no real ways to find people that you didn't know. So people would say, like I, when I was at ARP, we were super active on caregiving. So I would use hashtag caregiving on everything to connect to people who were caregiving for their parents or working in the caregiving industry because everybody, then you could see a full picture of everybody who was talking about caregiving. Today, down the road, Twitter and their product developers know that that's a behavior that their users do. So they essentially have made um, it all much more searchable. So like if I was to say um, uh, caregiving for my mom today, going to pick up her medicine, and I didn't use a hashtag, and somebody searched hashtag caregiving, that content would still come up in the conversation because Twitter is knowing that like your post is also about caregiving. That's why I think hashtags are not as important as they used to be. Um, and th so if she probably just made up her own, people aren't clicking on that hashtag and finding this post. It's just sort of an add on to this. But if you click on it, what are you going to? If you click on it, all you'll see is other people who have used that hashtag. It's just an organizing which, function. Which is helpful. Like I know um, it seems a little weird, but then when you're looking for certain stuff, like I worked for Orange County Public Schools, and one of the big driving things that I was tasked with was to hashtag smart as cool. Yeah. So I was able to go on to Twitter, and if I put in hashtag smart as cool, I can see other schools that are posting it, um, other projects that are being done, other like math and science competitions. So yeah. we could like kind of cluster it a little bit. Yeah. When Instagram actually incentivizes this um, in a way that I feel like other networks don't. So like if you're putting a hashtag on Instagram, you'll see like they all they basically have a, a, a directory that pops up and it will show you like if you're typing in hashtag social media, um, it will show you how many other people have used that hashtag. And then underneath it, it may say like social media training or social media fans or social media whatever and it'll show you how many people use those so on instagram you can use up to 30 different hashtags um now is that something you're probably going to be doing on a daily basis probably not but like if you really are trying to get the word out about cancer prevention then like especially if you're getting an editorial calendar out there and content out to people i, I do my editorial calendars by platform for that specific reason so that Facebook allows you more space. You can add more hashtags if you want them. Uh, Twitter, less space. Uh, still some hashtag unification if you want it, especially if you're trying to get that ripple effect. Um, and then on Instagram, you could use uh, you know up to 30. If you use more than 30 on Instagram, it doesn't allow other people to search it. Basically picks it up as spam. Um, and just generally, with, when it comes to Twitter, for example, because that's where I get a lot of my news, mm -hmm. from, um, but the, there's a way that you can check to see Yes. No, it, it's uh, so hash. So on Twitter, if you are an active Twitter user on your desktop or your laptop, it's on the left hand side. For, it'll be the trending topics, and you can select whether or not you want worldwide. You know, I, mine's set to Washington. Like you can set regionals or whatever, and see what's trending there. So what that trending topics thing is is the top ten things that within that universe people are talking about the most at any given time. So what you're seeing there uh, uh, and the hashtag kind of thing is that 
Twitter in particular <laughs> is very playful with hashtags. And so a lot of, almost every day there's some sort of like Twitter game or something. Um, like one like is like hashtag imp improve a movie by changing one word and it'll all be like squished together as a hashtag and then people all across Twitter will like go in and redo a movie title swap out a word to make it funny or whatever there are, there are kind of like games and then there are also like today the hashtag for the Planned Parenthood thing is pink out so I'm assuming because of the, the resources they're putting towards that that pink out will be a trending hashtag and like what you'll see around that is conversations around Planned Parenthood um, during a football game, that's going to be trending. March Madness is trending, those kinds of things. But if you click on March Madness, um, it, it definitely unifies everybody using hashtag March Madness, but it will also pick up tweets where people are talking about March Madness with March space madness without the hashtag. So it's, again, Twitter's, Twitter's mining their content for what people are talking about about March Madness and putting it under that trending topic, um, whether they use the hashtag or not. People just do because it's part of the community behavior and etiquette. Other hashtag questions, I feel like it is like kind of a weird thing that people do on social media that they don't do in real life. If you, if you walked up to somebody at a cocktail party and you were like, hashtag pink out, they'd be like, you're really weird, go away. <laughs> um, so um, local groups, national groups, their leadership, um, you know, at Prevent Cancer, um, RWJF News, you know, whatever causes you care about, I generally search keywords and try to find accounts and people who work there um, and really people who are making an impact. The sort of second tier of that is if you're already following those people, then finding influencers in that space. That's again, a whole nother like tier two, tier three of this thing is like social media influencers and who online can have the biggest impact to your cause. Um, I bet a lot of people would probably put you guys in the influencers category. Um, uh, local reporters and news outlets. So um, when, I, when I teach media relations um, and, and press secretaries how to better use social media for what they do, um, one of the things that we do right off the bat is take that beat list, list of beat reporters from your hometown, from the issues that you care about, and we go in, we find and follow them on um, Twitter in particular, but other social media properties where they are, you're essentially curating your own news feed. Um, this is not only so that you're aware of what they're posting, um, but I think it's more important to follow individual reporters than outlets, um, because I also find it to be a great media relations tool. Um, as people are talking about their day and what's happening, you often can get an early look at um, what kinds of stories they're writing and get ahead of that and get into them or also pitch them stories through. So my, my media relations skills and relationships are 100 times better today after all of my social media than they were when I worked in media relations full time. Um, but part of that is because I'm having, again, like holistic 360 conversations with people. So I'm talking to Chuck Todd about University of Miami football and, um, you know, obscure Florida politics in addition to pitching him stories. Um, so, um, accounts that just generally speak to your interests. None of these social media platforms are going to be worth a damn to you if you're not following things you care about or find entertaining or fun. So make them fun also, you know, find people that either are, um, entertainers or comedians or friends or whatever. If you have questions about like who you should be following that, like I ask this periodically just kind of for fun to see what people come up with and say, um, especially on like Twitter or something, I'll be like, who are you following that is your favorite person on Twitter that I should be following? And kind of just see what people say and kind of get feedback. And it's just a really neat way to enlarge your circle, um, which is what a lot of this is just really about. Just to pause Question. on this for a second, and, and if it's okay with you, we'll mm -hmm. share these. Yeah. Um, One hundred percent. But Summer Sanders was one of um, the congressional families. That we, um, she's somebody that we honored last year. She had uh, um, skin cancer. She was a swimmer. She is a swimmer, and she she found her first first or second skin cancer on her own. And I mean, I guess she had she she had melanoma, which you could see with a swimmer. You're outside all the time. But she actually um, then had a suspicious mole, and her doctor was like, "Don't worry about it." She's like, "No, no, no, I am worried about it." And it turned out to be a second um, melanoma. So that's why we picked her. Sherry Pagato is a UMass medical, she is from our district, but that just happened to be a coincidence. She um, is the main person who did research on tanning beds in 
college on college campuses. A lot of times supported by college campuses, um, you can use your um, your food card to get a tan, which is crazy. <laughs> um, so she's the one that did the, the um, definitive study on that and is working to you know try to pressure colleges to you know back away from those policies. And Dr. Ann is a nutritionist, and she. I'm sorry. Do you have parents know about that? Yeah, I, uh, exactly the I went to Florida State. I can't even imagine how much that is abused there. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, and, and, and either they're literally on the campuses or near the campuses, yeah. but sort of semi-subsidized or promoted mm -hmm. as part of the, um, Health as part of the um, marketing tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then Dr. Ann is a nutritionist that works with our foundation a lot, does, and she's done several seminars with us, and she you know, does um, you know, what to eat, what not to eat, that kind of stuff. So those are why we sort of a little bit more curated for our audience. Yeah, and then, you know, a, a sort of second tier way of if you're looking for other interesting people to follow or influencers is to sort of rabbit hole down who Summer Sanders is following and see if there are any interesting accounts you find there or who's following her. Um, I actually, like one of my, speaking of uh, the Donald Trump stuff earlier, I think like one of the things that's so interesting is Donald Trump wakes up at whatever, five o'clock in the morning and gets on Twitter. What does he see, right? Like you, what you see on your Twitter is fundamentally different than what he sees. And so I think it's fascinating. I'm actually, I've actually like built a Twitter list that reverse engineers how he looks at Twitter and what accounts he's following. So if you're trying to influence somebody, whether it's a reporter or a celebrity or whatever, looking at who they follow is a really interesting way of sort of reverse engineering and media relations because you want to get those people that they're following to talk about your issue also because it helps bubble up to the bigger person. Um, deep. <laughs> um, and then just, you know, again, accounts that speak to your interests. We featured uh, Whole Foods and Eating Well magazine, Be Smart, Eat Smart. Some of these are brands, obviously, and, and media outlets that you've heard of before. Be Smart, Eat Smart, I think, is an interesting one in particular. There are all of these people and sort of brands that are loosely defined famous on the internet, but like maybe not like something that's like in real life. So bloggers, you know, sort of lifestyle, people who like just have really big followings that might be interesting to engage on your causes are things that you want to kind of understand. Um, and oftentimes, I, my standing story on this one is when, when I worked at ARP, that we had this like total screw up essentially that like led to um, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal misquoting somebody who was like a, a member of the executive team on Social Security, and so like the progressive internet lost their minds because they thought they thought ARP was. Uh, negotiating on social security and we ended up having to like reverse engineer that message back down across the internet from the CEO that we weren't um, and one of the things that I thought was most interesting about it is when I started surveying who had the biggest reach looking at AARP and social security as keywords together um, most of them were things that you had heard of before they were the hill outlets or the reporters that we would deal with all the time um, number three on the list was a guy named Ray Beckerman who nobody had ever heard of Ray Beckerman lives in Staten Island. He's a lawyer in New York, not particularly active in ARP, and he was just pissed off that like ARP was doing this, and he has a huge audience. And so I remember giving this talk at ARP afterwards um, that was titled "Who Is Ray Beckerman?" Because of course nobody knew who he was. Um, but I was like, you know, part of this is like Ray. As soon as we reached out with, to Ray with the CEO statement and said, "Here's you know the CEO statement," um, would really appreciate you sharing it with your followers. He did immediately. It helped us tamp down um, sort of the outrage within that community. Uh, we put him in touch with the ARP New York media team and started inviting him to like press conferences and building a relationship. And you know, I think you know. And, in an ongoing way now that's a dialogue and so whether it's you know whatever your Ray Beckerman is you know might need to be added to your media list or who you're following because they might be more influential in some ways than um, a reporter or an outlet is yeah crazy I always wonder if Ray Beckerman's ever if the story has ever trickled back to Ray Beckerman that it, how much time we spent talking about Ray Beckerman in therapy <laughs> um, uh, accounts that speak to your interest. Uh, you, this is just a whole sort of like round uh, roundabout of uh, sort of Washington D.C. fitness kind of accounts. This you know is this is like a good smattering. But if you, you know if you're a, a Cubs fan or a White Sox fan, this looks a little different. If you love yoga but you hate spinning, or you 
uh, hate exercise in general, like maybe this isn't like the exact distribution that you'd have, but you know, you want to follow things that are not just about the cause or just about um, the news things that you're doing to make it more interesting to you. So we're going to talk a little bit more about trolls and like response. Um, so in general, what is a troll? You know, this is a loose definition, um, but you know, anyone, especially anyone, it can even be somebody you know, right? Everybody's got that. Friend. Everybody's got that friend or a family member who is a troll. But uh, but I think it's really, it's an internet term in general for people who are sort of like haters or constantly kind of coming at you on social media. Um, and you know. We talked a little bit about this earlier, so I'm not going like, to repeat the whole thing. But again, you can mute them, you can block them, you can report them. Um, I actually had an instance when I was at ARP that uh, somebody like had a legitimate threat towards a, a staff member of mine via Twitter. Um, and I will say uh, I was very heartened to see that the um, DC police took it very seriously. Um, it was like something like a bomb threat. And again, you think it's probably like, that's probably not true. And it's probably just somebody trying to scare you, but like, you don't really know. Right. And you're just like a staff member, a low level staff member at a nonprofit. Um, but DC police actually took it very seriously. They placed a car outside of her house for 24 hours and like very much took it seriously. So I, I would not be afraid to pull that card if you need to, to, um, report that to Capitol police. Um, uh, this is my favorite thing on um, trolls. There's a guy named Scott Strat Stratton who he's unmarketing on Twitter and he's a sort of social media marketer. And he, he sent me this poster that I had on my wall for years at ARP. That is like, remember, you are not the jackass whisperer. It is not your job, <laughs> nor your mission, nor should you be compelled to respond to every dipshit on the internet. Okay. So like, if you're going to be out there and you're going to be a public figure, people are going to say stuff, but you do not have to respond to all of those things. You do not have to engage as hard as it may be sometimes I have to just walk away from my computer and walk around the block and let it go um, but you know I think you see this with brands who sort of get into back and forth United Airlines had like this the ridiculous leggings controversy this week um, you know if they had just not engaged none of that would have happened as, as, as a result does everybody know about the leggings thing this is the like crazy penetration for social media but yeah so people had uh, I guess past writers had uh, wanted to board the airplane were wearing leggings and the gate agent told them their attire was not up to speed wouldn't let them board the plane and so like people of course everybody has their phone out and tweeting so at the gate agent people are taking pictures of her and like reporting it on social and everybody starts talking about it well of course like the next day delta was like <laughs> we are the airline of comfort feel free to wear your leggings you know so if you let if you if you engage and you put yourself out there like your sort of competitors may come back and and come back at you too um but you know i think this is the thing is you know whenever we're in these public positions whether it's a speech whether it's a public event whether it's twitter we all can be approached by somebody who doesn't have our best interests at heart and or is just trying to antagonize you or whatever and just knowing that you don't have to take that bait um, or run it by a friend or and maybe this is like where if you do have a Facebook group or something like that you can share experiences or tactics and things that have worked um, but uh, you know the best is just ignore it mute it walk away from it block if you need to um, but this is definitely something that it's not just limited to congressional families. It's something I deal with. It's something that every journalist deals with. It's something that anybody who talks about anything real or cause related or ever gets any kind of like profile um, has to deal with on the internet. It's probably not going away, even though everybody, every platform's trying to make tools so that you don't have to see it or you can hide it. Um, it's definitely a problem. Um, but again, it's it, most of the time it's minor and it's only as big as you make it. And so, um, being able to, just like you would at an event, if somebody was harassing you or walking away, reporting it or walking away from it online is okay too. Any other questions on that? Because I feel like that's, to me, I feel like if I was in your position, like that would be something that would be a con cause for concern. Used to it? I don't know. Um, all right. So just other cautions. Again, uh, we talked a little bit about geotags and not, not tagging yourself wide or at something. Um, I, I get a lot of people uh, that are executives that have like kids and families that want to make sure they're not um, putting them out there too much. Again, that's much more up to you. Um, but use, think about who's going to see that. And again, 
Facebook in a private Facebook friends group or your relatives or something like that if you want to put things out there and share kinds of things but then think about ones that are all public that anybody can see and anybody control that's where I probably would draw the line and maybe like not put the family stuff out there or at least control how you do it um, who you follow and retweet again we kind of talked about this in the sort of fake news zone but like if you're retweeting and you're sharing things really without looking or researching those things a lot of times it's really easy to get duped into sharing things that aren't true or can get you in trouble later um, uh, I'm gonna bring up direct messaging because all of these platforms have ways to talk publicly and ways to talk privately so um, that is another sort of I mean, I feel like when it comes to, like, we were talking a little bit about Instagram and, like, sending the videos back and forth or Snapchat with the videos back and forth. If it's Twitter on direct message, it's private between the two of you on, on Twitter and only can be seen on direct message. But I think a lot of people, um, especially people who are new to Twitter, can get in trouble with, uh, and not even people, like, this is like the Anthony Weiner thing, right? Like, the, <laughs> you can get in trouble with Twitter where you think you're having a direct message conversation and it, or you think, and it's really like a public conversation. So like, until you really start understanding the privacy settings, um, I think like still double check yourself. Um, but understanding like what's private and what's public I think is going to be really key to your success and to really being engaged in using it um, and then you know just in general thinking about like when you're posting like what does this say about me that you know to we talked about this earlier but the the internet ha uh, moves fast but has a long history um, so what you're putting out there says something about you personally um, and so when you're kind of again hovering over that button to post if you feel great about it post away if you're a little bit concerned that it might get you in trouble down the road, uh, you know, think it through and maybe don't post kind of thing. So continuing to stay current, um, you know, I feel like you can kind of do this to the extent that you like to, but there are a lot of people that I follow and I share best practices from. So I'm gonna give you the easy button to do it is I have an account called C-Suite Social. Um, on Twitter, it's at, hash, it's at C-Suite Social. Um, and so, I only follow either people who are like executives, CEOs, CMOs, sort of like leaders who do a great job of social. So it kind of gives you a list of people that you might want to follow for ideas. And then I try to share news and best practices that give people who I do trainings with tips there. Um, but if you see one that either is recurring or that you think is really great, Again, you're always trying to enlarge that circle and curate your news feed. So if you see one there that's particularly interesting to you, just make sure to go in and follow them also so that you start having that come to you directly. Um, there are, and if you, uh, if you tweet me or direct message me, I will like send you more, but I didn't want to overwhelm in the presentation. Um, but there are all kinds of people who sort of sell social media snake oil and are like, you know, everybody's an expert and everybody's a guru and you know, I don't know. Use, use your judgment of like what is, what is true and what is not. But you know, essentially they're always changing. All of these profiles are changing. Uh, people who are in a very uh, executive and visual role, like members of Congress, CEOs, things like that, are very much some of the, like, the, the last people to come to social media as active users. So I think it's a really fascinating space right now. Um, so I'm, I generally, the things that I'm looking for when I'm showing a best practice are somebody who understands the community and talks and and recognizes the language of community and so how they tweet makes sense it's within 140 characters sometimes it's a great use of hashtag around a cause but it, you'll see that it's very much showcasing people who show a 360 version of themselves so it's a mix of personal professional and cause related um, and i think that's the kind of thing is like if you think about it's super you know probably not intuitive to look at yourself and think about like what's the distribution of like my content strategy for my Twitter account um, but if you think about the things that you care about and the things that are interesting to you you know you can kind of see like what that um, what that pie chart would look like and like what kinds of things are news or what kinds of things are cause related what kinds of things are um, your favorite teams or a news article that you really found fascinating and so that's kind of like what it looks like to create a, an editorial calendar for somebody and so essentially what you're doing would be creating that for yourself any questions sir? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So one of the things we've talked about, we've got to talk about a little bit, is the idea of doing a closed congressional yeah. families cancer prevention Facebook page. What would that be good for, and and how would that work? Well, uh, closed Facebook groups, I think, are really great for. Um, both sharing messages, so you could you could one of the things we had talked about was easy button content that Pre the Prevent Cancer Foundation could create. You know, like a weekly Facebook post or a weekly tweet to share that people could then just come in, cut and paste, and share on their pages or tweak and make more personal for themselves. That's something that you could certainly put there and share. Um, again, you're putting yourself in a box so that like, the trolls can't get in because it's protected in a protected space. Um, I also think that especially as everyone's on this same kind of track and same kind of evolution of dealing with this personal professional hybrid on social media, that I think you can ask uh, the smart questions, the dumb questions, like where are the privacy settings on this? How do you geotag this? And you can kind of crowdsource and answer each other's questions and kind of help each other get smarter. Um, you could also, you know, depending on, you know, who you wanted to add into that group, you could add other people who are like social media specialists to like answer some of those questions or bring people in to answer some of those questions. Um, most of my Facebook private groups, um, of which there are a zillion when it comes to social media, <laughs> um, are used for keeping up with those changes. Like I talked earlier to you guys about how fast everything changes platform wise and like how to stay up on top of it is kind of a, like a whole cottage industry. So everybody from, you know, NBC news to craft is in like this closed Facebook group of social media managers. And it'll be like, Hey, I just will screenshot our screen. This new button popped up. Do you guys have this? Or are they beta testing it? What's happening here? Cause it's changing so much that like in some ways, like none of those things are stupid questions to be like, what the hell is this new bubble thing at the top of, Facebook. It wasn't there yesterday. So answering those questions for each other and sharing ideas like that, that's essentially like what we're doing in those sources. Um, figuring out uh, who amongst us has contacts to answer our questions that we don't know. So like that's a, that's a lot where um, we're doing like Facebook lives from the mall for a live broadcast on PBS last summer. And it was like, the answer to what you're asking doesn't exist. So how do you figure it out, right? And so it was like, okay, this person knew this person at Facebook who was piloting this program and you're kind of like figuring out with amongst your network in that private Facebook group who has the the right person to figure out a solution to something. Um, and I think that would be effective for you guys. Um, you know, and, and to your point earlier, um, if you were to do something where it was a collective action, like you were all going to, uh, pick a either a month or a time period to do personal posts on how cancer's affected your family or how it's impacted your district or whatever that is. You would all be posting that on your own personal pages, which would have a really big impact for your communities. But you could also use a group like that to share that content. And when you're posting it to amplify each other or to pull that into a collective space where Prevent Cancer could amplify that, something like that. Yeah, um, so all of these all of these platforms have or are building live functions, um, and you can you can attribute this to the selfie generation if you if you will. But essentially, it's everything everything and everyone is now a live show. <laughs> so um, I, I think there's a lot of terrible Facebook Live out there, and there's some good Facebook Live. But anytime uh, Facebook in particular uh, launches a new product jumping on it fast is a way to game that algorithm. So they want people to be using Facebook Live. You'll see they're probably pushing it at you at every angle. And essentially like my, so my fear, and this is as somebody who is like trained people in media relations and on camera interviewing a million times, my biggest fear in staring at a camera is dead silence <laughs> and like the awkwardness of being like looking at the camera and sort of all of that stuff. So I think feel like Facebook Live really plays into that in a way. So think if you have like those kinds of like feelings about being on camera or on those kinds of things, think about how you would um, set up your show differently. So I do a lot of times where I'll bring somebody on to interview or I'll um, set up a conversation so that you have more people talking because a lot of times you'll you'll do something like you could say I'm going to do a Facebook live today to talk about the importance of cancer prevention and it probably would garner a lot of views and a big audience but then like if you're relying on ask me questions in the comments below and I'll answer them 
and like people aren't online during that five minutes that you're there, then it's like you staring at a camera just talking and gets awkward. So it's almost like Facebook Live's great and it's a really great tool and it certainly reaches a lot of people right now. But I would also think about thinking about it like you do any kind of like video or on camera presentation that you want to like think about in advance, what kinds of questions, what kinds of things can I keep talking about? Or can I set up a Q and A in advance? Uh, can I plant questions in my feed so that I have like, do I have five friends that I can say, hey, I'm gonna do this, will you ask me questions? Um, you know, my mom does that sometimes where she'll like log in when I'm doing a Facebook chat. Um, but you know, those kinds of things are just things you, you know, if you were a TV producer or a radio producer, they would come naturally to you. Um, but uh, for most of us, that's not something that comes natural. And so if you're using Facebook Live, I think that's probably the biggest tip is Think about it in advance, plan it in advance. What messages do you want to get across? And if they can get across in 30 seconds, get them across in 30 seconds. Like, don't leave yourself out there for 20 minutes. Most of the Facebook Lives, while people Facebook serves them up to a lot of people, so they'll generate a lot of views, most of those views drop off after 10 seconds. So, yeah. So, I, I, you know, as somebody who works with a lot of brands, one of the things I tell them is if you're – if, you do, if there's not something every, I used to say every 30 seconds, but now every 10 seconds. If there's not something every 10 seconds in that video that keeps my attention, then it needs to be shorter. So like whenever I was doing like ARP Studios and like how did we get to 1 million view videos, it was by doing that. If, if, if there wasn't something compelling and something dramatic or a, a, some kind of stat that was important in that video, then it needed to be shorter and shorter video performs much better on social media. So nobody needs to be talking for two minutes about something they can say in 20 seconds. Questions? Video is huge. Like, I, I, I don't know how much I believe uh, this because I feel like all this stuff just changes so fast, but a lot of why you see so much attention to video on all these platforms is uh, essentially the uh, communications consumption predictions are that something like 80% of news will be delivered by video by 2020, which is not that far away. Um, so, you know, you see all of these uh, media outlets investing in Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and how they tell stories via Facebook Live. And um, you're constantly not only telling the news and, and figuring out how to tell the news in different platforms in different ways, but also engage with the audience and manage trolls and bring in followers. And, you know, it's all these things that, you know, didn't exist for media outlets 10 years ago. Question? We've been putting up uh, congressional testimony, mm -hmm. and uh, when my wife uh, asks a question and tries to always make sure that American Samoa is answered so that all of her yeah. constituents uh, is incorporated and so all the constituents would be interested. But I'm not quite sure, uh, this is on Facebook, I'm yeah. not quite sure who's seen this. I mean, you know, when, and I'm trying to compare videos to see what plays and yeah. what doesn't play. You know what it is when you get a lot of comments. Right. You know what you what you're getting when you get a lot of likes. Yeah. But then there are other categories like this video was seen by. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does that mean they clicked on it and saw it or so, got into their inbox or you're going to see a lot of change in social media metrics in the next uh, year or two. Um, if you if you follow it uh, as closely as I do, there. Um, there are basically like Procter and Gamble and all these big brands right now who are holding the social media um, platforms to an audit uh, because everything's so apples to oranges that it's really difficult to say like, should I spend my ad dollar on a YouTube video ad or a Facebook ad or a promoted ad? So you're hitting on one of the issues uh, that uh, brands have really served up to these platforms, which is I don't know which of these me metrics matter. Um, so when I was at ARP, the, the one that I really hung my hat on was shares. Shares is much harder to get. Shares is I'm taking this piece of content that you made and I think it's so compelling, funny, interesting that I'm gonna share it on my newsfeed with my friends and followers. Most people don't do that. So to me, the way to get at what content is performing really well is shares. Um, what you're seeing as, um, people who may have seen the content versus viewed the content, and this gets into, again, the semantics of like video metrics, um, may have seen or seen is it visually crossed their path. Yeah. So like 
if you're a brand and you're paying for people to see your video on like Facebook or YouTube, you could say, I want, um, I want 20,000 people between the ages of 25 and 35 who live in Tampa, Florida, and like Bruce Springsteen to see this video. So it can serve it up into the feed, but that, again, like, it's not, it may not be interesting to those people. Is the video compelling? Does it feature Bruce Springsteen? Or are you just trying to target people who like Bruce Springsteen? And so you, if you're serving up congressional testimony to Springsteen fans in your hometown, like, that may not be a match, right? So it crossed their path. They saw it. But did they actually view it more than 10 seconds or 30 seconds, which would mean it would qualify as a video view? That's why the video view metric is so much smaller and tighter, is that's showing you who has watched it. On YouTube, I believe it's they have to watch 30 seconds to count. On Facebook, I think they have to watch like 12 seconds to count. Again, another reason why brands really push back on this is did they, if we're paying for that video view, does anybody get anything out of 10 seconds? And the answer is not unless your video in your ad that you put in front of them was 12 seconds. Otherwise, you lost everything after. Um, and that's why it's so hard as a brand to find out whether or not this stuff is compelling or not. People who do it right do it incredible. Very few people do it right. Um, I suspect congressional testimony is probably not the most engaging piece of content. So if it's a really important issue to her, I would say shoot another five 15 to 20 second videos saying why it's important and distribute them over a number of weeks to make sure the message gets out there um just because i feel like sometimes people just not everybody's a c-span nerd like me sometimes people see c-span and their mind just sort of passes and shuts down um because it just feels like it's going to be like boring content but they like her and they're they have a connection so um a face-to-face -face video with a nice background might be more compelling Questions? Yeah. Just getting back to the, the dumb basics. Yeah, no, they're important. Once you have a Twitter account, what do you do with it? Sure. I mean, what do the little signs mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? Why don't I do this? I have a I have a Twitter basics guide for executives that's like pretty concise that I'll send to Lisa and Cassie to share with you guys. Um, and it gets a little bit more into like how to think about your own social media like an editorial calendar. Like um, like one of the tips in there uh, is you know, to, to set something where you just get, because part of this is just habit forming. So like once you're, once you're an active Twitter user, you're never gonna have to think about like, what should I post on a Monday? Um, but the, the one of the ways that they talk about it is to do like, okay, on Mondays, share an article that you thought was interesting. On Tuesdays, you know, give a shout out to a member of your staff or somebody you think is interesting. On Wednesdays, talk about your cause. On Thursdays, you know, it kind of helps you set some parameters around like what's helpful and it also, um, gives you the um like the very basics of like what's a retweet what's a direct message where are those on the mobile app and those things um so i'll share that with you guys okay. yeah Great. and i have one for facebook too so i'll share that too yeah. Everybody's like energized now. Like, yeah. that's what we need. i mean honestly like you'll you may look at it but like i would also just like tack it up on a cork board somewhere or like save it because it's one of those things little little things change and evolve so it may and i think it's probably a year old but it gets through the basics and i think is like helpful for you guys Please take a folder. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, this thanks so for having great. me. I mean, the thing I love about Tammy is not only the great information that she gave us, but she gives it in such a kind of a fun way. I mean, I will now always think of, um, of social media as a cocktail party because I thought that analogy was so perfect. And it really is yeah. the people you kind of want to stay away from and the way that you engage people in it. Yeah. It does, not only does it is it a great parallel, but it also makes it more accessible and less scary when you think about it that way. So. Yeah. Well, one of the things I tell people is like, if you're writing like what your first five tweets are going to be or something like that, say them out loud to another human being and feel and see how like they do they feel right? Do they feel awkward? Because it's sort of like five tweets is just five sentences, right? So is it like, hi, I'm this follow my cause like that would be awkward at a cocktail party. But like, hey, I'm Tammy. I really I, I'm really passionate about cancer prevention. Next tweet upload a video here's why it's important to me my mom you know had cancer and blah 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 and like i upload a 15 second video you know as long as that's a natural conversation arc which is i think really hard when you're first starting out to think about stuff like that but if it's a natural conversation arc as if you would talk to another human being as opposed to like a press release headline that's really where your sweet spot's going to be great well, yeah thank you thank you thank you everybody for being here also um, stay tuned because i i want to 
start, I mean, seriously, I may come to you in your district and come film you 30 to 60 seconds, or we may figure out a way for you to do it yourself. Um, Jim has, in his office, Jim does actually a fair amount of um, little films, and he has those, those the, like the white umbrellas and the cameras to have the video quality come out, so we're figuring that out. And I just want to know that before when we showed Ted Lou's profile about um, husband of Betty, well, here she is. So, <laughs> we featured you later. Superstar. Thank you, everyone.